this passage we're going to look at this morning would be very appropriate for Mother's Day, and I'm pr pretty sure that when some ladies look at this, they say, there is no way that I can do what this woman does. Well, I'm not here to ridicule what you're doing, but I am here, and the scripture's here, to give you some help in what you do. So it is not... This is not to say if you're not doing these things that you're a terrible mom because your children would probably say otherwise unless they're mad at you anyway. But this is a good passage to help us see. And I think I, I mentioned this to my Sunday school class this morning. In every family, it doesn't matter what family, if there is a mom present, she is going to be the center of what goes on in the family. Because I know my, I had two sons. I still have them. They're grown and married and have children of their own. Where Matt sick wanted dad. Probably because I would have said, suck it up, boy. Get tough. <laughs> but I know I never asked for my dad when I didn't feel good when I was a kid. So. Mom, you, you guys, and I say that generically, you ladies are the center of your home. And you're going to see that pretty clearly today because, uh, as I mentioned in my prayer, that church sign right down the road, Jesus left, Jesus took care of his mother. And you and I are to honor our parents. So let's look at Proverbs 31, verses 10 to 31. And there are nine principles, and we're going to go through those quickly because I don't want to keep you here all day. Beginning with verse 10. An excellent wife, who can find? If you don't know by now, that is a rhetorical question. By that I mean it, it is answered in the question itself. Who can find an excellent wife? It's not easy. That's the idea. For her worth is far above jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. She looks for wool and flax and works with her hands in delight. She is like merchant ships. She brings her food from afar. She rises also while it is still night and gives food to her household and portions to her maidens. She considers a field and buys it. From her earnings, she plants a vineyard. She girds herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She senses that her gain is good. Her lamp does not go out at night. She stretches out her hand to the distant, and her hands grasp the spindle. She extends her hand to the poor, and she stretches out her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. She makes coverings for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies belts to the trade. Strength and dignity are her clothing and she smiles at the future. She opens her mouth in wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and bless her. Her husband also, and he praises her, saying, Many daughters have done nobly, but you excel them all. Charm is deceitful, and beauty is vain. But a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her the product of her hands, and let her works praise her in the gates. Let's ask the Lord to bless our time. Father, we thank you for this time. We ask you to honor your word. Help us see these principles, Lord. And I pray that in the days ahead, we can apply them. It will make a difference in our families. Help us do that for Jesus' sake. Pray it in his name. Amen. This passage that I'm because they feel they cannot live up to this kind of person. Well, I have good news. The woman in this passage really sets the standard high. But in order to be a virtuous woman, the standard needs to be set high. Let me set the ground rules for this passage on Mother's Day 2018. One, I'm not attacking your family. Most of you, I don't know how you do it. I'm glad you do it, but I don't know how you do it. I'm simply giving you some principles that can be used to make your life and the life of your family better than it is now. That's all. 
two, I'm not suggesting that you stop what you're doing and try to live up to the standard set by the woman in this passage. No, the principles are found here to help you as you struggle in being whom God wants you to be. And if you're a human being, you struggle. That's all there is to it. Three, God does not expect you to be just like the woman mentioned in this passage. No, you must become the woman God wants you to be. You cannot be someone else no matter how hard you try. With this out of the way, let's consider this passage and pull some principles out of it that will help families no matter what the situation. Let me say this also. The man may be the head of the family, but the woman is the heart of the family. I didn't hear an amen, but that's okay. She is the center of all that goes on. That is clear from this passage. Have you ever seen a passage in the Word of God that talks this way about a man? N-O. There isn't one. Nine principles stated in this passage, and they help us see what an excellent woman needs to be. I pray this helps you in the future. Because, folks, in 2018, we need godly women. The first principle is this. An excellent woman is hard to find. In verse 10. It's hard to find. You say, well, how do you know when you found one? You will. Look at this passage. But what this means and what it doesn't mean are two different things. This means an excellent woman is found in proper places. Not a bar. Let me say that again. You don't find excellent women in bars. And if you're a woman who haunts bars, an excellent man is not going to find you there. That's not where he looks. Not walking the streets, not living with someone apart from marriage, waiting for the right one to come along, just biding your time. You say, well, Brother Keith, you know so much about this. Where are excellent women found? Well, I could point to mine and say, there you go. But you can't have her. Number one, and this is probably all you need to know, they are found walking with God. Number one, my mother is the only one who ever sat down with me and pointed me to Jesus Christ. And not only that, she knew the scriptures. She taught Sunday school, I don't know how many years. But more than that, she lived what she believed. And it was evident. Found walking with God. They're found loving God's word. If you go to my mom's house today, you will find Bibles on every nightstand, every place there's a chair, because when she sits down, it's one of her favorite books. And on Sunday, an excellent woman is found in the house of God. Billy Graham said that when he was alive, of course, and I remember him saying this even before I went to the crusade that happened down in Tampa, Florida. He said, a lot of young men come to my crusades looking for young women. Let me say that again. Billy Graham said, a lot of young men come to my crusade looking for young women. Why would they do that? Excellent women. Excellent women. The scripture says right here in verse 10, their worth is more than gold, silver, or precious stone. In other words, you cannot buy an excellent woman. And you most certainly cannot sell one. An excellent woman is hard to find. You say, well, Brother Keith, what if the woman I find is not excellent? Well, you better keep that to yourself. But secondly, and I would encourage you as if you are the man in a family, you are, according to Scripture, the head of the house, and you are to lead your wife to be an excellent woman. You know, if you ever if you know anything about sheep, if you see a guy behind a herd of sheep with a whip cracking, you know who he is? He's the butcher. He's driving the sheep. What does the shepherd do? He leads the sheep. You probably heard it said you can catch more flies with honey 
than you can with vinegar. I'll let you figure out what that means. Number two, an excellent woman is trustworthy. Look at verses 11 and 12. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. Her husband trusts in her. And notice, in his heart, the heart of, his, of her husband trusts in her. That's the center of his being. He has no doubts about her integrity. She does not prevent him from honest gain. As a matter of fact, she will do all she can to make sure that he has no doubts about her. She supports him in his work. Let me tell you something humorous that my wife did for me years ago. And I, t I say this because it's humorous. I know what her heart was. It was a particular morning, and she always wanted to make my lunch before I went to work. Well, she didn't have a dessert, and I'm from the South. You don't eat unless you have dessert. So she took a small bag, it's already had some of them out of it, of marshmallows and put into the... Well, I opened up my lunch and there's this bag of marshmallows sitting on top and there were guys all around me looking to see what I had in my lunch bucket and boy did I get ribbed about it. But I can't tell you the hundreds of times that she made my lunch and guys watching me eat it mouth-watering because of what she prepared for me. She supports him in his work. I remember a tragic accident happened in West Palm Beach. I was working over there with Chicago Bridge and Iron and one of the guys on our job fell inside a tank on a steel bottom, 47 feet, and it killed him. It didn't kill him right away. We had to push the ambulance in there because of the sugar sand to get him, and he died about an hour later at the hospital. And my mother told me sometime later, she said, son, I pray for you every day, but I guess I forgot to pray for the people you work with. She said, you believe that if she had prayed, that wouldn't have happened? That's not what I'm saying. But the, the, the wife that supports her husband supports him by prayer and by being wise with what he gives her. We're going to talk more about that. She has, according to this passage, his best interest at heart. And I'm going to tell you, when I got married to this young lady down here, I didn't have a concept. I didn't have a clue of what I was doing. And maybe some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. But we worked together. She always supported me. She wanted me to succeed. She worked my way through seminary and college. She's trustworthy. Matter of fact, my wife is so trustworthy, I'm bragging on her because it's Mother's Day. And it's, as far as I'm concerned, Mother's Day in my family is Wife's Day, too. But I put her on a plane Tuesday to go to Missouri and babysit my, some of my grandkids, and I picked her up last night at the airport. That's how much I trust her. And I told her, I said, if anybody bothers you, you point them out to me when they get off the plane. I'll take care of that. Number three, an excellent woman provides for her family. Look at verses 13 to 15. She looks for wool and flax and works with her hands in delight. She is like merchant ships. She brings her food from afar. Oh, I've got a lot to say about that. She works with her hands. That doesn't mean you have to be so physical that you have calluses. It's okay to do that. But she takes care of her household. According to this, she looks for the best deal. Let me explain that to you because some of you are a little concerned, I believe. The word here in the Hebrew that for looks means to study or rub your hands on. Folks, you can't look at something. I'm sorry. Ladies can't look at something without picking it up and making sure it's what they want before they buy it. It's much like, you know, if you go to a place that sells fabric, you don't just look at fabric, you feel of it. And that's the idea. 
feeling the material before it's brought. But that's not all. Look what else it said. She brings her food from afar. Now, if you're southern, that does not mean she brings her food from a fire. <laughs> Could be, but that's not what it's saying. Listen, folks, this is a principle that makes... Let me tell you, the household I grew up in when I was a kid, Wednesday night was hamburger night. Every Wednesday night, we had hamburgers. That's one time a week. And I've heard people say, well, I don't eat chicken because I ate chicken a lot. So did I. If it wasn't for chicken and hamburger, I would not be here. <laughs> Wednesday was hamburger night, and I don't remember the other night. That's the way my mom did it. And then occasionally she would surprise us. That's the idea of what this passage is saying. She does not cook the same thing all the time. Uh-oh. Microwave. Folks, food cooked in a microwave just isn't quite as good as something not. She finds different recipes and keeps the family delighted with her food. Can you imagine little children say, wonder what mom's going to have for supper tonight? That's the idea behind it. We're not done yet. She gets the household going early. This is a principle all through the word of God is this idea behind early. Let me explain it to you. The idea of a morning person versus a not morning person is foreign to the word of God. And I've heard friends say, well, I'm just not a morning person. Join the military. You will become one. She gets the household going early. She provides food early. Notice what it says right here. She rises also while it is still night and gives food to her household and portions to her maidens. What's that mean? The word portions there is the idea chores. She gets the chores assigned early. She prescribes tasks to the family. You will get this done when you get home from school. You will get this done when you're finished with your chores. You will. You'll notice there's no arguing anywhere in this passage with the excellent woman. My mother was an excellent woman, and if you argue with her, you pay dearly for it. As a child, anyway. Number four, an excellent woman, Number six, verse 16, is careful with money. You say, uh-oh, I might as well slide down under the pew right here. Notice what it says. She considers a field and buys it. The word considers means to think with the purpose of planning or deciding a course of action. This is not foolish spending. This is careful deliberation before buying. Do you know what buyer's remorse is? That's when someone talks you into buying something you don't need, and when you get down the road, you realize it. It's too late then, is it? But you say, why a field? Why not a house or an apartment? Well, her household in this context raised their own crops. It would not be wise to buy something that could not be used. Boy, if our culture could figure that out. Well, I bought this at the thrift store. What is it? I don't know, but it was a good deal. Can you use it? No, but it was cheap. Come on, folks. People do that all the time. I almost want to go over to the SNS sometime and ask them if they would let me try to talk people out of buying lottery tickets. So give your money to me and I'll invest it. I'll just take it down there and give it to the church is what I'll do. And see what happens there. Because you get more of a return by putting your money in the offering plate than you do by buying a lottery ticket. And I know some people saying, well, no, I've won the lot. Oh, you have? Do you need to go online and look at all the horror stories of people who won the lottery and in five years or less they are broke? What did Jesus say? If you're not faithful in little things, you won't be faithful in big things. And if you can't handle the little money that you have now, you won't ever handle a lot of it. And God knows that better than you and I do. 
The principle is to buy what is needed before what is wanted. Notice what else it says. She plants a vineyard out of her earnings. This means wives are supposed to have money. And she earns it. Because what happened back in those days if you planted a vineyard? That's for you children, a vine yard. You grow grapes there. A vineyard would bring income. Think of what a vineyard would bring. Number one, grapes. You can eat them. Number two, you can squeeze them and drink the juice. And number three, <laughs> you can ferment it and sell it to other people for wine. Because we're Baptists. We don't drink. But she does all of this because it benefits the family. You can make all kind of applications to this idea. Dave Ramsey talks about several ladies. Uh, some of them were, when I say middle age, I mean younger than me. Who started a, pro one lady started a produce business out of her backyard. And it's grown to a multi-million dollar company to this day. This is a person who considers carefully before they buy. Is this going to benefit me down the road? Is this going to make my family have an easier way? She does it because it benefits the family. Number five, an excellent woman is resilient. Look at verses 17 to 19. She girds herself with strength and makes her arms strong. You say, what in the world is that talking about? She takes care of herself. If mama wants to sleep late in the morning, clean everybody out of the house and let her sleep late. She is strong. She is able. But that's not all. She senses that her gain is good. Her lamp does not go out at night. Oh, my. She senses that her gain is good. Her honest work pays off, and she can sleep at night. When it says her lamp does not go out at night, she's not afraid of working late. A very wise lady told me, and those of you in the farming industry could understand this, it was a terrible day when they put lights on tractors. You say, why? Because now the farmer can work at night. There was a time you had to get it done during the day. She's not afraid of working late. And the fruit of her labor lasts a long time. Is that not what we need in this country? To build things that we don't have to replace in six months because it's wore out? Because you, you may not know it, and you probably don't have to, but that's okay. What does it say in verse 19? She stretches out her hands to the distant, and her hands grasp the spindle. You know what that is? She is spinning yarn. And if you know anything about that, it is hard work. She makes sure the job gets done because she's not afraid of doing something hard. Number six, look at verse 20. An excellent woman is generous. She extends her hand to the poor and she stretches out her hand to the needy. Now, if you look back up at verse 19, you see the same language. She stretches out her hands to the distant and her hands grasp the spindle. It's the same idea there. At just in the same way as she stretches out her hands to work, so she stretches out her hand to the poor and needy. What are these verses showing us? That hard work allows us to give to the poor. You realize that? Think about this. This may be a new concept to you. You may have never heard it before. But if you work hard and you get to the point where you have no debt, all of your income is yours. What? call names, but I won't do it. I know people personally that if the economy hit the tanks right now and it's bad enough as it is, they'd lose everything they've got because they're financed to the hilt. Your great-grandparents didn't borrow money. 
Your grandparents borrowed it and paid it off as fast as they could. What did my parents do? Borrowed money. What did they teach me to do? Borrow money. Borrow as much as you need. Go down to the bank. Say, I need this. Yep, here it is. Sign on the dotted line. You say, what did we do before banks? We saved money. I read a statistic. 65% of Americans have no savings. None. Don't even have a savings account. And the 35 that do have a savings account have much less than three months worth of savings in it. When I was, the first car I bought, I bought a Mazda RX-3. You say, what is that? It was a red car with a four-speed that's all I possess. And I financed it for three years. It was three thousand and something dollars. And I paid it off. And after I paid it off, if I had start if I had kept saving that payment in less than three years, I'd have had enough money to buy another one. Huh? That's a foreign concept. Why do that when I can just go down to the bank and borrow it? Because we want it now, don't we? We're the microwave generation. Hard work allows us to give to the poor. Because if we don't have any debt, we can be more generous. And if we're financed to the max, we can't give anything to the poor. We can't give anything to the church. We can't give anything to anyone. That's why it's a good idea to learn to save up for things. When I was growing up, I had a good friend. His dad was my pastor. He was the middle son. He's going to be here in October for revival, just to get you prepared for that. Ron's a dear brother in the Lord. But anyway, his first car, I forget what it was, he paid for it in cash. He saved the money up to pay for it in cash. The second car... He put such a big down payment on it, he paid it off in six months. Now, I went with him to McDonald's, when, and he's no bigger than I am. I went with him to McDonald's, and that boy could put it away. I'm telling you right now. But he learned how to save money and say no. We live in a society that doesn't know how to do that. If you teach your children to save, and if you teach them and this is a good thing to do with children and grandchildren. Just put something on your kitchen table with a slot in the top that says God's money. And say every week or every pay period, we're going to put a portion of that in that and we're going to give it to God. And teach your children to do that. Have you noticed when we take the offering up, some of these kids are delighted to give that money? If you teach your children to love to give, they will keep doing it. Let's go on. Number seven, an excellent woman provides proper clothing for her family. And I might park here for just a minute. Notice what it says. She's not afraid of the cold. Why is that? Because her family is clothed to be warm and her family is clothed beautifully. You say, well, I can't sew. <laughs> I, can't, I can sew a button on. But as long as she's around, she's going to sew the button on because she's faster at it than I am. My mother taught me how to do that a long time ago. But notice, sandwiched in 20, 21 to 26 is this unusual verse. Verse 23, her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. What has that got to do with clothing? Her husband is clothed well he is respected by the city of officials because of who he is and because of what he wears because what happened it reflects on the care and love of his wife someone commented on my tie this morning and I just deflected it because I just put it on I didn't pick it out she picked it out. It reflects on the care and love of his wife. 
let me t give you a principle right here. Men respect a man who is loved by his wife and everybody can see it. And speaking of clothing, I've heard all the arguments. Well, I want to stay in style. If style means a plunging neckline and a short hemline, get out of style. It is not necessary. It is not necessary. And ladies, you do not want to be responsible for making a man look at you longer than is necessary. Charlie Martin was my pastor at First Baptist Indian Rocks for several years. And I remember him saying this from the pulpit. He said, guys, it is not a sin to be driving down the street in Clearwater, Florida and see an attractive woman walking down the sidewalk and look at her. It's not a sin to do that. He said the sin is when you take a right and come back around where you can look at her again. And ladies, this is, I know a lot of weight on you, but listen real carefully to what I'm going to say. You do not want men looking at you for the wrong reason. And if you draw attention to certain parts of your body, they will. You say some of them be Christian men, probably so. You dress to draw attention to your face. If you don't, hopefully you have a husband who has a concealed carry purse. That's all I can say. And the clothing in our culture, you see what the, these, I don't know what they call them, they're glorified prostitutes as far as I'm concerned. Most of the women in Hollywood have been married seven or eight times. They can't stay married longer than three months to anybody. And then when they're on stage, they dress like they ain't dressed at all. Now you can worship that kind of malarkey if you want to. You know what dress attracts me? What women used to wear in the 1920s. Up to here and down to the ground. And it, they were beautiful. They did not draw attention to any part of the body except the face. You say, well, the style won't let me do that. Then learn how to sew and make your own. Nothing wrong with that. My mother, listen guys. My mother made me a leisure suit. How many of you remember leisure suits? It was made out of polyester. Oh, my. But let's go on. We're not done with that passage. Notice what else it says. In verse... Oh, strength and dignity are her clothing, and she smiles at the future. You know what that means? She's not concerned about tomorrow. There's just today. Isn't that a scriptural principle? Take care of today. Because tomorrow's not here yet. You remember I told you about that restaurant down in, in the St. Pete area that's on the close to the beach that says free beer tomorrow. Yeah. It gets your attention, that's for sure. She is not afraid of the future because she has planned for the future. She has taken care of making her family ready for whatever happens. Guess what happens to those who were debt free when in 2009 the economy was in such bad shape? Guess what happened to people who were debt free? Nothing. Nothing. Didn't bother them a bit. But to the many people who had financed a house and they got into these balloon mortgages, folks, if you need to be talked out of a balloon mortgage, maybe you need to have yourself a counselor on hand somewhere. She is prepared for the future, and we would do well to do the same. She is a woman of wisdom, wisdom, godly wisdom. And that brings us to number eight. An excellent woman is loved by her family. Look at verses 27 to 29. She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Idleness. 
What's the old saying say? Idle hands are the devil's workshop. Dr. Gary Williams told a bunch of preacher boys when I was in college, he said, guys, get busy for the Lord. You won't have as much time to sin. Oh, but this is what's amazing. Verse 28, her children rise up and bless her. The King James says her children rise up and call her blessed. And her husband praises her. What does he say? Look at what he said. Man, this, this ought to be ingrained on our minds, men. Many daughters have done nobly, but you excel them all. Let me put that in my language. Many other women have done well, but you far exceed anything they've done. If you say that to your wife, get ready. She's liable to slap you because you say, what have you done with my husband? <laughs> Loved by her family. Verse chapter, number nine, number nine, we're done. An excellent woman is one who fears the Lord. It will end that, that, you couldn't end on anything better, verses 30 and 31. Two things define an excellent woman other than all these other things we put there. Number one, her fear of the Lord. You say, why are we supposed to be afraid of God? That's not what that means. You ever been to court and it was your fault and you didn't have a lawyer? It's a scary thing to stand before a judge that does not know you and you don't know her or him, whoever it might be, and have them tell you do something and you better do it or you're going to get locked up. What kind of fear is that? It is a real high level of respect. Knowing that person can do with you whatever they want to and you can't do anything about it. That's what I'm talking about. When are we going to get it in our minds that God can do anything He wants to and He may not even ask our permission? And some people say, well, that's not my God. Well, if that's not your God, then you created one. That's the God of the Bible. He doesn't ask anybody what He can do. She fears the Lord. Her respect for Him, her, she loves Him and looks to Him in all things. And then number two, her works. What she does. Look at verse 30, ladies. Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain. You know why the writer said that? And by the way, this is the words of King Lemuel, verse, verse 1 of chapter 31. You know why he wrote charm is deceitful and beauty is vain? Because they don't last. Outside beauty doesn't last. I heard the other day that, uh, I don't remember, it was a, a movie star back in the 90s, what she looks like today. Well, if you get caught up in that on Facebook, it's a mess. Anyway, I don't care what she looks like. This I know. This I know. We're not going to look the same in 10, 15 years as we do today. I'm sorry, it's not going to happen. Her works, what she does, defines her. Character defines the excellent woman. Her fear of the Lord and what she does. Because you can tell a lot about a person by what they do. Let me ask you, men and women, what defines you? Have you ever thought about that? You know the pizza commercial, uh, what do you want on your tombstone? doesn't really matter what you want on there because when you're gone, you're, the kids will put whatever they want to on there. But what one word defines you? Let me give you some words that may... Are you dramatic? Are you melodramatic? You opinion, everybody's got an opinion. I heard an old saying said everybody's got an opinion and opinions are like armpits. They all smell bad. Are you wise? Are you emotional? Are you faithful? Are you tired? 
joyful, intelligent, and we could go on and on and on. Yet the writer ends this section by saying something unusual. Charm is deceitful. What does that mean? If you spend all your time trying to be charming, you're lying to yourself. And he says beauty is vain. Beauty is an idol that many people worship. Have you seen the little Barbie dolls? Normal people don't look like that. That's abnormal, and yet what do we do? We make that, oh, everybody should look like that. Can you imagine Barbie in 35 below zero? <laughs> the poor girl freeze to death, and Ken right with her. Folks, I'm not saying everybody ought to be portly like me. But the reason you are the way you are is a little bit outside of your scope of control. If you and I could make us anything we wanted, what would God have to do with it? Charles Spurgeon, one of my heroes of the faith, is with the Lord now, was what I call portly. He was a little bit overweight. Hey, and at the time, he smoked cigars because that was the thing to do. Folks, if you try to fit into the mold that our society throws out at you, you're going to run into a brick wall every time. Character comes from the inside, not what's seen on the outside. And folks, this is what's amazing. Ask an older couple who's been married a long time, do you love your spouse? And they will probably say more than when we first got married. He said, but you don't look anything like you did when you got married because I didn't fall in love with the outside. I fell in love with the inside. You see, character will be there when the beauty is gone. And why is if you spend time making yourself beautiful for anyone other than God, it's meaningless. You say, well, I do that for my husband. You need to be doing it for him. Wives and mothers spend some time thinking about this passage. I pray you'll commit yourself to God to be a woman who fears the Lord and is known by what she does. I can't stop without saying this to men, though. Men, are you helping your wife become all God wants her to be? If not, why not? Do you want a better marriage and family? Then quit listening to Dr. Ruth and crackpots like her and start reading the words of the wisest man that ever lived. Do you know that Dr. Ruth advocates, as a matter of fact, she even pushes people to do this thing called masturbation? Do you realize that's what that woman does? And says it is okay. I'd slap her if she was standing here. It's ridiculous. This kind of thing is thrown out in our, and I like what Mark Gunger said. He says, man, if we don't talk about these things in the church, it's not going to get talked about out there at all. Or if it is, it's going to have a twist to it. If you want a better marriage and family, it's real easy. It's going to take hard work. But if you ever farmed, you're used to that. I guarantee you, when you put that seed in the ground, your work's just started. As a matter of fact, before you put that seed in the ground, your work's barely started. There's been many a time when we got to the harvest when I lived in Missouri, I could not believe. Because most of the corn plants would have an ear on it about that long, just one ear per stalk. But it all started with one kernel of corn. And I decided I was going to take Jesus at his word one day, and I counted the kernels on one of those their ears, sometimes 12 inches long, full all the way to the end. 
And that one kernel or that one ear of corn, I counted 97 kernels. That's almost a hundredfold. If you want your family to be what you want it to be and what God wants it to be, you've got to do it his way. Because all you got to do is look around you and find many, many, many people who aren't doing it his way. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this passage. It shows us not just wives and mothers, but families, what we need to do. And help us realize that when we do it your way, it makes all the difference in the world. When we do it your way, there's not near as many mistakes. There's not near as much aggravation. And plus, we can put our head down on our pillow at night and sense that you are pleased with what we've done. Father, help that be the situation with us. I know you've spoken to your people. I pray that decisions that need to be made will. On this day, Mother's Day 2018, in Jesus' name we pray.